Pop Up Flamby's Life and Calendar. Good morning, fellow mathematicians. Welcome back to another day of Papa Flemish Advent Calendar. That was the right pronunciation, right? That ain't good. Welcome back to Papa Flemish Advent Calendar. <laughs> We are going to take a look at the continuation of the effective potential video today. Namely, we are going to take a look at the Lagrangian problem, which was by far one of my most favorite Lagrangian problems out there because it involves a lot of good stuff. So it was actually an example I talked about in the effective potential video where, where I said, imagine like a table where a marble can spin on the top all the time, okay, attached to a string. And this string goes right through the middle of a table, hanging down there with another mass m hanging down there, capital M, and the small mass m is rotating on top of the table. They could be the same mass, they could be different masses, etc. But there's actually a lot of cool stuff surrounding this problem and it's going to be a two-part series. Today we're just going to find out the equations of motions of the swing and in the next video about this topic we're going to take a look at the effective potential part of that and actually an equilibrium position of the rotation where this mass m right here is going to stay stationary. So you can rotate the marble up there at a certain rate such that this mass m down here stays at the same z position all the time which is absolutely quite fantastic if you ask me. Also don't forget to check out STEM Merch 10% of all design requests today meaning you are going to go to the page that's linked down there in the description design requests if you find something that's to your liking shoot me a message at support at stemmerch.com and you are going to get 10% of the piece where you want to have the design on. So check it out it's definitely worth it. A um, bunch of cool design requests created already. Also 10 to 15% of everything over on my Teespring shop using code 42069 at checkout. Now we are going to dive right in. So if you never heard of Lagrange mechanics it's basically dealing with different kind of energy. So it's, it's some kind of the total energy of a system and differentiating this partially. Using the Euler-Lagrange equations you can find the whole analytical mechanics playlist down there in the description. So for other reference videos. So at first you want to find out the so-called Lagrangian which is just the difference of the kinetic energies of the systems and the potential energies of the system. And we are going to start off with the kinetic energy and then we are going to um, go ahead and talk about the potential energies in the system. So the thing is Two things can possibly move in the system, meaning we're going to have two kinetic energies. On the one hand, we have a mass m spinning up here on the table all the time. Our string right here is going to be massless, okay, doesn't have any mass. So we have a kinetic energy of this marble up here on the plane, basically, and then we have a kinetic energy of this mass m. So for, for example, if this mass up here is stationary, then it's going to slide right through the middle of the table is going to converge there, meaning this right here is going to slide downwards. So it has a set um, direction which is going to change over time. So basically a set velocity. And at first we're going to take a look at, uh, yeah, it really doesn't matter, at the kinetic energy of the small mass. Meaning we're going to take a look at Tm. So as always, kinetic energy is comprised of the following, m over 2 times the r vector, so the distance, okay, in, in here, in this coordinate system, squared, but that's not distance, that's the velocity. So, so basically just the velocity vector squared, I'm terribly sorry about that. So from this point onwards, we can start taking a look at how we could place a coordinate system into this problem right here, into this sketch that we're having nicely, such that we get a good kinetic energy out on the other side. And for that, it does make perfect sense to put the origin of a 3D coordinate system right here at the hole, okay? So meaning we're going to have a coordinate system like this. This right here is the Z component. Then we have an x coordinate here and a y coordinate like this. Really doesn't matter how you put x and y, I really don't care. And now we can go ahead and find out what the motion in this coordinate system actually is. I mean, without loss of generality, um, we are not going to have that um, our small mass m is going to have a z, z direction. Um, bound to it. So, so it can remove really into the set direction. So we don't want it to fall through the hole, for example. Meaning overall, it's just going to slide on the table in two dimensions, namely the x, y plane. Meaning overall, if we were to track this into a 2D coordinate system, this movement, then we have the x coordinates and the y coordinates here. So we have the marble being up here 
And this right here is the angle phi, which is going to change over time. Okay, it's going to rotate in some way. It's going to change over time. And this right here is just the magnitude of our radius, which can also change over time. Like mentioned before, our mass m could converge to the whole, meaning our radius is going to get smaller and smaller. Or if it spins really fast, it's going to get bigger and bigger over time. And then we have certain um, x and y coordinates attached to it. And always those are just polar coordinates, meaning our r vector in the first place, so just the position at all times in our coordinate system of the small mass m is going to be comprised of, okay, x over r is the cosine of phi, meaning overall the x coordinate right here is going to be r times the cosine of phi. And down here we have r times the sine of phi. Please take into consideration that our radius r is going to change over time, this is time dependent, and also our angle is going to change over time without loss of generality. So if it spins our um, angle is going to change over time, meaning that's also time dependent. Meaning if we were to find out what the velocity at all times in this coordinate system is, meaning r vector dot, this is going to be just the differential in time of both coordinates separately. Now if we were to differentiate both respe with respect to time, this is like a function with respect to time times a function with respect to time, meaning we need to use the product rule. So at first we're going to get r dot times the cosine of phi, and now r is going to be preserved in the next part. Hmm. Then we have to differentiate the cosine with respect to phi at first. We need to use the chain rule because this is cosine of phi of t. So meaning this is going to result in negative sine of phi. And the inner derivative of phi with respect to t is just the angular velocity, so phi dot. Okay, and the same spiel down here, just with the difference that our sine is going to turn into a cosine when differentiate. So r dot sine of phi and then plus r phi dot times the cosine of phi. And this right here is our velocity. And now to get to our velocity squared, this is just a scalar product of this vector with itself, meaning we are just going to square each and every component in here separately. Meaning overall, if we have the r dot vector squared, it's going to turn out to be, and I'm going to put this under each other, each um, entry squared because it's going to make more sense, it's a it gives a better overview. So squaring the first one is r dot times the cosine and then negative 2 times r, r dot times phi dot times the cosine times the sine and then positive and now we are going to get r squared phi dot squared times the sine squared. And now under that we are going to put this component squared and you are going to see that it does make sense to put it like this. I'm always doing this in my exams because it's it just um, looks way better, it gives you a way better overview overall. So this is r dot squared, I forgot the squared right here, I'm terribly sorry. And then we are going to get the sine squared and then plus 2 times r, r dot, phi dot, cosine, sine. And then plus r squared, phi dot squared times the cosine squared. Now we are going to notice something, namely those two have opposite signs. They are just going to cancel out in the process. On r dot squared, we're going to have the common factor of r dot squared and we're going to factor out cosine squared plus sine squared, which is going to result in one overall. Now, same should be here, we're going to factor out r squared and phi dot squared and what's going to be left in parentheses is sine squared plus cosine squared, which is nothing but one. Meaning overall, our r dot squared is going to turn out to be tm is hence nothing but m over two r dot squared plus and then mass over two times and the second part right here is just r squared phi dot squared. Isn't that cool? And now we are done with the first part. Now what about the second part? What about the kinetic energy of our big mass m? In which directions can this big mass m move? Hmm. I mean, without loss of generality, we are going to assume, like Im imagine it like an elevator, okay, and you have like a shaft where our mass m sits in, and it can only move in the z direction at all times. Meaning our kinetic energy is comprised of capital M over two times, okay, and the velocity is just a change in the z direction squared. Okay, easy as that. Now, change in the z direction squared. This is not good because in Lagrangian systems, we want not too many variables. We want 
um, only as many as we really need. And we are going to see if we can maybe um, get our z dot right here in terms of our two other time dependent variables that we already have in the system either r dot or let's say far dot maybe there's a way to get it with respect to r or far in some way and there actually is a way is there something in our system that is constant at all times well there actually is namely the length of our string. It's not going to change over time. It's, it's, it's not like a spring. It's, it's just a rope where two masses are attached to it. Meaning the total length, small n, of our rope is going to be preserved at all times. Namely it's comprised of the z direction plus our magnitude of the r vector. And this is good because we can now solve for z. Meaning z is hence nothing but l minus r. And if we were to differentiate both sides, we are going to get, okay, z dot is hence nothing but, I mean, the length l is constant. It doesn't change over time, okay? If you put a string to it, it's going to be really interesting of a system. It's going to be horrible to find Lacrosse for that, but try it out for yourself. But rather, we are going to get negative r dot. If we were to square both sides, we are also going to get that z dot squared is nothing but r dot squared, which does make perfect sense sense it's the same situation as with the Edward machine I mean if both masses are coupled okay with the same string then if r changes over time at a certain rate then z is going to change over time with the same rate does make perfect sense if you think about it for a second meaning the kinetic energy for this big mass is nothing but m over 2 times r dot squared and this is good. Now we got the kinetic energies, meaning the total kinetic energy of the system, T, is comprised of T of small m plus T of big M, leaving us overall with, okay, here we have R dot squared as a common factor, leaving us with M plus capital M over 2 times R dot squared. And last but not least, we're going to add this part to it, plus M over 2 R squared Part dot squared. Okay, so this was the first part, and now we are going to take a look at the potential energies in the system. And this part is actually really easy. So at first let us take a look at the potential energy of the small mass m. And the potential energy in layman's terms is just mass times gravitation acceleration times the height in the system. And if we consider our table to be, well, just the place where we start counting the, the, the potential energy, that means that our small mass m really doesn't have any potential energy because it doesn't have any height with regards to the table. I mean, if you, uh, even if it were to have some kind of height, we would just get a constant factor u naught, okay, added to this whole thing um, as a constant potential. But other than that, without loss of generality, we can just assume, well, really doesn't matter. It doesn't have any height with, re with regards to table because it lies directly on top of the table if our mass m is just a point mass, so basically dimensionless. Meaning overall, u of small m is zero. But that also has a consequence coming with it, namely if we were to calculate u of big M, well, U of big M is also the total kinetic energy, uh, the total potential energy of the system, which does make sense if you think about it, because the total potential energy of the system is just U of capital M plus U of small M, but U of small M is zero, meaning this is just the potential energy of the big mass. And this right here is mass, so big mass, times gravitational acceleration, times the set coordinate in the system. Now what's the set coordinate exactly? Thing is, with regards to the table, our big mass is hanging in the negative z direction at all times. Meaning we are going to get a negative sign in front of that. And what was z exactly? Well, z was nothing but L minus R. And hence we are done with all the energies. That was easy, right? And now we can go ahead and just put everything together and then apply the Euler-Lacroix equations. No, apply yeah, apply the Euler-Lacroix equations to the Lacroixian because um, we are going to apply an operator to it. And then we are basically done with the equations of motion. Meaning overall, our Lacroixian is going to look as follows. Our Lacroixian is being defined in this system as nothing but the kinetic energy, meaning m plus capital M over 2 times r dot squared plus m over 2 r squared far dot squared. And then negative our potential energy negative and negative is positive so plus capital M times G times L minus R. 
And that's our Lagrangian and now we are going to find out what the other Lagrange equations, so the equations of motions are actually going to be. Thing is, we have two constraints in the system, namely two time dependent variables, one being far, so our angle that's going to change over time, and the other one being our radius that's going to change over time. So we end up with two coupled equations of motion. So first one, we are going to start off with, let's say, with the r part, it really doesn't matter. So we are going to differentiate the Lagrangian with respect to r. Now, everything that is r, call it x for example, meaning r dot is not your x, okay? This ain't your x, this right here is just another variable, for example, y. Meaning this right here is going to die in a corner somewhere, because if you differentiate Lagrangian with respect to r, this right here is not with respect to r. Now we have to differentiate this part and we have to differentiate this part. Namely here, we are going to track the two down, leaving us with m times r times phi dot squared. And then, okay, if we differentiate this with respect to r, we have to use the chain rule, basically, because of parentheses, or you can just factor everything out, making that part with the L vanish. We're going to get a negative sign and m times g. So this right here was the first part. Now, what about ddt? Second part of the euler lacrosse equations of the partial derivative of L in r dot. Well, this right here is going to be the time derivative of, and now, be careful, okay, we are differentiating with respect to r dot at first. So this right here is not with respect to r dot and so is this one neither. Meaning we just have to differentiate this, leaving us with m plus capital M, dragging the two down, times r dot. And overall, differentiating this with respect to time, okay, masses are not time dependent on the system, meaning r dot is going to turn into r double dot, leaving us with m plus capital M times r double dot. Meaning overall, the first equation of motion that we are going to get is the following one, m plus m, because those two are equal, okay, this is what the all, all other cross equations are going to tell us, times r double dot, this hence nothing but m times r times phi dot squared minus m times g. And to check if you are right on this one, you just need to see if the dimensions fit, because this is the best indicator if you did the right thing with the euler lacrosse equations. I mean, this right here is obviously a, a force, okay, mass times acceleration. This right here is a force, mass plus mass is mass, times acceleration is, is nothing but a force. And this right here, okay, far dot is one over second, squared is one over second squared, meters over second squared is an acceleration, times mass is a force. Force minus force is force, so we are done with that. Good stuff. Now we are going to take a look at the second Euler Lacrosse equations, namely, we are going to take a look at del L with respect to far. Whew, that's an easy one, actually, because that's not with respect to far, neither is that, and neither is that, meaning this right here is zero. Okay, Gucci stuff, but this right here is equal to ddt of the Lagrangian partially differentiate with respect to far dot. Okay, so this is going to result in ddt of, that's not with respect to far dot, neither is that one, so we need to track the two down on this one, leaving us with m, r squared, and far dot, and differentiating this, with respect to time, is going to result in zero overall, due to the euler lacrosse equations. You can compute this, okay, this right here is going to be um, time dependent and this right here is time dependent, really doesn't matter, but this right here has an even better conclusion uh, um, attached to it, which we are going to talk about in the next video. Those are the two equations of motion, okay, Please keep them in mind for the next video. But before you actually end watching the video, I invite you to check out today's sponsor Brilliant, who are kind enough to sponsor yet another video here on this channel. I don't know if you ever played online games before, but if Lagrangian mechanics, Hamiltonian mechanics, analytical mechanics in general were some kind of weapon in this online game, then it needs to be nerfed. It's just too overpowered. And using polar coordinates or the like, spherical coordinates, cylindrical coordinates on problems like this is just absolutely ingenious. And it works wonders and it's just like a jackhammer method to problems like this, just like complex analysis is to integrals. And I just love it. It just feels terribly good to solve those problems. And if you are curious about those concepts, conservation of energy, um, momenta, angular momentum, etc., then I invite you to try a print today because they actually have a lot of physics courses over on their website and they are definitely worth checking out because they cover a lot of the basics and also a lot of advanced um, topics. I invite you to just try it out for yourself because their interactive course concept is really brilliant, just like the name would suggest. And I just love working through their courses and trying stuff around and playing with those graphs. Like um, there was this one calculus problem where you had to figure out what the slope is going to be for this one cannon shot and you could track around the tension line to the curve leading to the 
derivative and it was just kind of good. It, it felt really good to, to get to the solution by tracking around all those visuals and it's, it's, it's just really nice. I just love it. <laughs> Just like my live streams, if you never watch one of these, make sure to check them out because I cover a lot of their courses over there and we always have a lot of fun together, me and my subscribers in those live streams. And sometimes I also don't get the right ideas when solving the problems. And I actually um, love learning about new stuff and Brilliant offers me that opportunity, which I find to be really cool. So if this feels like a something for you, make sure to check out the link at the top of the description with it. You are going to get free access to a big portion of print already. And the first hundred people to actually use the link get 20% of an annual premium subscription. Which is a great deal if you ask me, considering how much content they have lying around over there. So many courses, nearly 70 interactive courses at this point, which is a lot. And it makes for a perfect Christmas present for your um, STEM interested son, daughter, cousin, whatsoever. So check it out and support the channel this way. If you didn't enjoy this video, then please like, subscribe, and comment channel if like. If you want to support the channel a bit more, buy those t-shirts I create or support channel on Patreon. Up until next video, I'll show you guys a flammable day. Ciao!